Good evening and welcome to our home prayer meeting once again. And tonight it's also again another privilege for us that we may lead you also in the Word of God. So today, may I turn your attention to Ephesians chapter 4. And today, as we continue our study, we will be looking at verses 8 up to verse 10 of this passage. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. And the Word of God says this, Wherefore he said that when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Before we look into the word of God this evening, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, today we come before you knowing that you sent your son who died for our sins, that though he died, yet he is the victorious king who descended and ascended, giving gifts unto his body, the church. Tonight, Father, I pray that as we look into your word, may you guide us into all the truth. Help us to see the things you want us to see, and may the truths, Father, that we receive from your word this simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. Last week, we have learned that every believer who has experienced saving grace receives enabling grace from God. We got that when we look at verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 4 where we saw the following things. Number one, that grace given by the Lord Jesus Christ as we will see in verses 8 to 10 are the, is the spiritual gifts that every believer receives for the purpose stated in verses 12 to 16. Also, part of these spiritual gifts, as expounded more in verse 11, is the apostleship of the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. And the gift that of Christ is the salvation given by him freely to all those who believe based on the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Now, as we have talked about verse 7 last week, we see this as a pivot point that from verse 4 to 6 that talks about unity, verse 7 pivots into diversity which leads ultimately to unity in verses 7 to 16. If last week we saw the act of the Lord Jesus in giving the gifts, tonight we will be looking at His authority to give those gifts to men. Now, we have to acknowledge that verses 8 to 10 is one of the most difficult passages in Scripture with lots of presumptions and traditions. But my prayer is that none of those would hinder us from seeing the real force of the passage. Now, the key to that is to understand that in your Bibles, meron siyang dapat parenthesis, okay? In verses 9 to 10, there is a parenthesis that shows that this is an aside by the Apostle Paul. Now, an aside is a peripheral comment or citation, not the main point. So, it's not the main point. So let us expound our passage tonight, being faithful to the text and drive it more than anything else. So we see in verse 7, Christ gives grace according to the measure of His gift. So we ask now, by what authority does Jesus give these gifts? And we see the answer in this passage, by the authority of of the victorious King. Now, our prayer is that you would see the Lord Jesus Christ as the victorious King who has all the authority to give 
gives to His body, the church, according to His purpose. Mark these words tonight. Jesus, the victorious King, gives gifts to His body, the church. So tonight, let us expound our passage looking at the following things one by one. The first one is the reference. Okay, We read in verse 8 these words. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, this is actually a reference to Psalm 68 verse 18. Can you turn your Bibles to that? Psalm chapter 68 verse 18. Okay, the word of God as the psalmist would write in verse 18, says this, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, we see the he that Apostle Paul says in verse 8 of our passage, sino yang he na yan? So that would refer to the psalmist in Psalm 68. So who is this psalmist? Let's look at verse 1. And the heading of that psalm says this, To the chief musician, a psalm or song of David. So Paul's he is David. For he said, and then he quoted the psalm. And the psalm that he quoted, and what he, he wrote, have actually some differences between the two accounts. Let's note those differences, okay? Number one, perspective. In the psalm, he says, Thou, or it's a second person, Thou ascended on high. That's a different perspective. In Ephesians, it says, He ascended up on high. So different perspective. So we'll note that. We'll move on. Another is that when Ephesians refers to a time, he has when, okay? But Psalms, the Psalm reference is given in static. The progression is also the same. He ascended on high, led captivity captive, but the discrepancy is in the third line, which is that he, the Psalm says, receive gifts, okay? But sa Ephesians, sabi, Give gifts. There's something there. Ephesians also omitted the line, the last line of the psalm, which says, Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, for this reason alone, scholars are in a struggle and a bind. Why? They're th seeming to say, What did Paul do here? Bakit ganong kadaming differences and dis uh, differences between the psalm that he quoted? Some of them posited and postulated that Apostle Paul quoted from another source. So, and more questions. Because if he quoted on another source, what is that source? Where is that source now? Why is it different from the Psalms? Now, I reject that idea. I reject that notion. Some scholars even said that when Paul wrote this Psalm, he quoted it as a paraphrase, loosely. Again, I reject that presupposition because Paul being a, a Pharisee would have been very strict in his quotation of scripture. But what we can see here is what is called a dispensational nuance that can only be deciphered and understood if we acknowledge that Apostle Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles in the dispensation of grace. Well, Paul had been saying that since chapter 1. He repeated it in chapter 3 and chapter 4. So, uh, that must be acknowledged. Now, I want you to look at it this way. Now, the psalm has a different perspective. When David penned that psalm, he was thinking of the Messiah. He was thinking of the millennial kingdom. He was thinking about the time that the Messiah would be victorious in his second coming and he will be receiving gifts from the nations even from those who are rebellious. Makes sense. That's already in the passage. 
Now, in the Ephesians perspective, I want us to really understand that the victorious king will receive gifts. And he gives those gifts to whom? His own body, which is the church. So, Apostle Paul's perspective is that in the millennial kingdom, David's perspective, he receives gifts. But in Apostle Paul's perspective, he gives gifts to his own body, which is the church. But ultimately, what threads these two passages together is the idea. What's the idea? David's psalm shows a victorious king. Okay? Paul, in Ephesians, quoted this psalm saying as a revelation that the victorious king is Jesus Christ, who did three things. Number one, he ascended upon high. Number two, led captivity captive. Now, that statement is another one that is loaded with traditions and questions. Now, there is a man named Larkin, and he made a chart. Okay, In the chart, he spoke about the state of the soul, which is, after the, dead, after the death of a person, if a person is righteous, he goes to paradise or Abraham's bosom. If he is wicked, he goes to hell, another place. And sabi, they are separated by a very uh, bottomless gulf or chasm. Larkin equated that with a bottomless pit of revelation. Now, Larkin surmised that paradise, which is the abode of the righteous, is now empty, having, uh, having the first fruits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, taking the inhabitants of paradise to the presence of the Lord in the third heaven. He uses Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 10 for one of the verses he cited for that passage. Now, contextually, the only time, aside from Ephesians 4, 8 and Psalm 68, 18, that the phrase led captivity captive occurs in Judges chapter 5, verse 12, where it speaks about Israel's victory over Canaan with Barak. Now, these words, these two words, captivity and captive, appears in conjunction with one another in two other places, and every time it appears, it speaks about a victorious ruler or leader who leads captivity captive. So, the idea of the passage is simply showing how victorious a king Jesus is. So, Jesus Christ ascended upon high. He, uh, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Ultimately, this shows the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as the victorious king to give gifts to men. Now, the next two verses shows us what and how the Lord Jesus triumphed that gave him that authority to give gifts to men. So, we'll see the next one. If you saw the reference the first, we we'll look at the revelation. Okay, from here, we would look at the parenthesis in verse 8 and uh, verse 9, and we read these words. Now that he ascended, okay, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So, Apostle Paul is expounding on if he ascended, what does this mean except that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So, what does that exactly mean? Now, the phrase lower parts of the earth appears three times in scriptures, one, uh, two times in the Old Testament, and only one in the New Testament, which is our passage and Psalm 68. Now, in the other two times that this passage is used, we see that it is a place of judgment for the wicked who oppose the judge, the just. So let's look at Psalm 63, verses 9 to 10. Psalm 63, verse 9 to 10. Okay? The Word of God says this, 
but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. So, the psalmist, which is David, uh, it, also in verse 1, the psalmist says that those who oppose the just will go to the lower parts of the earth. So, it seems to be the place of judgment for those who oppose the righteous. Isaiah 44, verse 23 also speaks of it as a contrast for heaven. Isaiah 44, verse 23. Okay, let's look at that. Isaiah 44, verse 23. Okay, it says there, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and glorified himself in Israel. So, heaven, earth, mountains, forest, contrast for heaven. So, what is the place that Christ went to? To the place where, which is the contrast of heaven and the place prepared for the judgment of the wicked. So, to hell. Sounds scandalous. So, Jesus went to hell? What? What's happening here? But hold up. Okay? Isn't this what is written in Acts chapter 2, verse 26 to 27? Let's turn to that. Acts chapter 2, verse 26 to verse 27. Pay attention. Sabi In verse 26 to verse 27, this is the Apostle Peter speaking. Okay, he says, Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy and thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So, this is not David, though this is a quotation from Psalm chapter uh, in the Psalms. So, if this is not David, who is this? We continue reading in verse 31 onward, it says, uh, verse 30 onward, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. So, it's very clear. Christ was prophesied that he will go to hell. But isn't this also what Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says? When Jesus speaks about he being in, uh, that he is showing the sign of Jonah? What exactly happened to Jonah? So everyone knows the Sunday school version where Jonah was eaten by a big fish. But there's something more about that. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus Christ made it clear. Using it as a sign for those in his generation. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Okay, this is what Jesus Christ said. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we're saying, we know that. Yes, we know that. We knew that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried. So heart of the earth. But there's more. I want you to look at Jonah chapter 2. Jonah. So, medyo hindi nagagamit na pupuntahan masyado yung book na yan. So, Jonah. Yan. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Okay, the Word of God says this. Then Jonah prayed, out, uh, Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So, nasan daw si Jonah when he prayed? He was in the fish's belly. And then he said in verse 2, And said, 
I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and He heard me out of the belly of hell. Oh, <laughs> sana yan. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Jonah died and went to hell. Parang that, parang bam, that's something very different from what we have known. But if Jesus is saying that the sign of Jonah is like him dying, being buried, and rising again, that as Jonah was three days in the fish's belly, and as Jesus was three days in the heart of the earth, the heart of the earth refers to Jesus going to hell. Parang, wow! <laughs> that is something else. But this is what is being referred to by descended to the lower parts of the, of the earth. The Lord Jesus descend to hell. Now, we have to understand that the word lower parts, okay? Hindi ba yan siya plural? It's plural. So, it signifies two parts. Namely, torments, which is the place for the unrighteous, and Abraham's bosom or paradise, as we can see in Luke chapter 16, verse 23. What did Jesus do in hell? <laughs> what did Jesus do in hell? Let's read 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 20. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20. This is what the Word of God says. For Christ also hath suffered, hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was up preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So, what did Jesus do there? He says he preached to the uh, spirits in prison. Another, another verse, uh, we see that the Lord Jesus preached to the spirits that are in prison. So, what did Jesus do there? This shows that Jesus, even in his death, is triumphant. Triumphant because of what happens in verse 10. In Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 10, it says this, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far uh, up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So I want you to get the idea. Christ descended to hell and he ascended to heaven. We read this same thing in Acts chapter 2 again, verses 31 to 33. Acts chapter 2, verses 31 to 33. Okay, this is what the word of God says. Again, Peter is preaching. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So, Christ, who descended to hell, ascended to heaven, not only rise from the dead, but also ascend to heaven, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We see this corroborated in Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20. Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20. Now, I hope your Bibles did not omit this part. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, in Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20, the Word of God says this. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, 
the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So Christ not only rose from the dead, He is ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ descended to hell and He ascended to heaven. Why? We read in our passage in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 that He might fill all things. You see? Hell, heaven. Victorious in hell, victorious in heaven. We read that also in Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. So we'll turn to that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 23 says this, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who are to believe according to the working of His mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ultimately, by the descent of Christ to hell and his ascent to heaven, we see that Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven, earth, and even hell. It's a misconception that they say the Lord of hell is Satan. No, he is not. He is not. Jesus is Lord of all, who is, or He is not Lord at all. Jesus is the Lord of heaven, of earth, and even hell. He is the Lord of life and death. He is the Lord of the living and the dead. He is both Lord and Christ. He is Lord over all. And with this victorious King of Kings, He gives by His authority gifts to people that would accomplish His purpose. Friends, I want you to see that reality, that Jesus is a victorious King. And as He had died for our sins, He was buried, He descended to hell, He ascended to heaven, He gives gifts to men. Did you know that the greatest gift that Jesus still gives to this day is the gift of salvation. Remember that we have a debt before God that we cannot pay because what sin is exacting from us is death. Before a holy and just God, we cannot we cannot reason ourselves away. We cannot simply try to palusot our, our way. We cannot simply try to say, Lord, this is what I've done. No. Before a holy and a just God, we are sinners and what we deserve is death. We cannot pay for it because the wages of sin is death. We cannot pay for our salvation. But because of the grace of God, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, He paid a debt that He did not owe. He paid the debt that we should have paid, but He paid it by His life dying for our sins, being buried in the third day, rising again. God had deemed what He has done on the cross sufficient to pay and cover the sins of man. For that reason, salvation is offered as a gift. Offered freely that the only way to be saved is not by our good works. No, we cannot be saved by our good works. It's not even what is demanded. But we are saved by simply heeding the call. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Friends, believe that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Believe that what he has done on the cross is sufficient for eternal salvation. And that is the greatest gift of all. But on top of that, the Lord Jesus, the victorious King,
gives gifts to his body, the church. Friends, my prayer is that you would see the Lord Jesus as a victorious king. And by that authority, he gives gifts to men. Thank you for listening. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word today. That your son, the Lord Jesus, is the victorious king. And by that authority, he gives gifts to men. Father, today I pray that the truths that we have received from your word would simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. If you have prayer requests, we would love to pray for you. And you can write it in the comment section below or you can send us a private message. We hope to see you also on Saturday for our Comfort Verses in Context where we will see why it is needed to look at our Comfort Verses according to its context. Thank you very much for listening. May the Lord bless you.